as you walk through the valley of the shadow of hell, you will realize that there is something ahead. Something that lurks behind the dark veil. A veil that is beyond our own comprehension. What's up, guys, and welcome back to Beyond, Beyond the Void, or podcast. That's right, it's episode 158, and today we're going to be talking about two Italian horror movies that are connected loosely to Lucio Fulci. Actually, well, not loosely at all, but they are connected to Lucio Fulci, and I haven't seen these. Have you seen these? No. No, I haven't. Okay. Well, we did. We, we did Voices from Beyond. And we also did... The Wax Mask from 1997. What was the other one? Voices from Beyond. No, the year. It was 1991. Yeah. Okay. So these are both 1990s films. Actually, one of these uh, movies was given to me by a uh, a friend and viewer uh, for the uh, stream that I do on uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. If you guys ever want to come hang out. (laughs) (laughs) I got these cheeseburgers, No, I'll man. suck your dick, man. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're going to be talking about these two movies, which we haven't seen, both of us. And we got some thoughts about them. One is very different than the other one. Obviously, there's no real connection other than this Lucio one's Fulci. This not like the other. Yeah, one of them was written by Lucio Fulci, and then the other was directed by Lucio Fulci. And written. And, and well, oh yeah, that's right. It was written partially by him, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so how have you been this week? How's things going? Uh... It's been all right. I had my last class for, uh, you know, the baby class. It was baby class. The yeah. baby, baby. Uh, what, it was a breastfeeding the first class, day is like... which was cool because I wasn't the only dude in there. So you were breastfeeding. Yeah, you know. You Do know. they make you wear it, like, to, so you can? I'm just saying, like, it... <laughs> just so saying, you... I'm really interesting. You know? No, 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 no. I mean, like, I'm not being a jackass. Is what I'm trying to say. No, no. They just because, like, I've seen some classes actually make them the the. the the significant other wear it if they don't breastfeed so that they know what it's like to hold a baby etc right and no just i like did the know. different holds and stuff like even though i'm not going to be breastfeeding i did learn You're those not? holds yeah you, you know what i'm dry come on dude i can't squeeze nothing it's a team effort patrick <laughs> shave your nipple and get squirt some milk out whatever you got <laughs> no i want him to be able to distinguish us you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> Like powder milk coming out. The baby's all like, what the fuck? <laughs> but yeah, that, that was interesting. And uh, I, I was glad that I wasn't the only male in there. <laughs> Kudos to all those males out there supporting your women. Yeah. And, uh, you know, learning all you can just to support yeah, breastfeeding. them. Breastfeeding. Yeah. You got to. <laughs> you got to support your woman when she's going through something like this. I just like picture them like, because we got into that big conversation earlier about breastfeeding and everything and how people get shamed for it all the time. Right. Only and here like, in America, by I the way. I picture like you, they're like, okay, now we're going to put it on you and we're going to make you put the false breast on you and then you're going to hold the baby, the fake baby, and you're going to breastfeed it and see what it's like. And then, then some other guy comes out of nowhere and he's like, you disgust me! Like, <laughs> and they just said, this is what it's like. <laughs> They just have a guy in the back waiting to do it or yeah, something. It's like, <laughs> God damn, dude. That's like fucking brutal. brutal. He's like the fake assaulted and like... Uh, You're like, excuse me, uh, sir? Right. It's like that dude they, they hired to go in while women like practice their like self-defense moves on. Yeah, like, he's j- a mugger. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but you guys, uh, just so you know, I'm not against it or anything. I'm right. Not, I'm not. I'm just making jokes because that's that's what I do. Right. right? That's, how, that's how I operate. Yeah, you know I also don't breastfeed children either. They didn't this Patrick. Just, <laughs> just to clue you in, in case you can't read between the fucking lines. 
<laughs> we do got to spoon feed a lot of people these days. <laughs> yeah, speaking like. of which, by the way, we got some new writers on the podcast uh, website for longlivethevoid.com. If you guys don't know, we do weekly articles. One that Kyle Laugh does, that's the newest trailers, the horror trailers right, and releases. Right, right. How's he doing, by the way? Is he still oh, running his podcast? You know, he's he hasn't done the podcast in a long time, but he's been writing, uh, doing reviews and doing that newest trailers and stuff like that. Plus, we got some new people, guys. So I urge you to go check out their articles because they're actually really good. And uh, I'm really glad to have them on the team. So welcome, Brendan Carrion, Rebecca Reinhardt, and of course, Eric Mifford. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the team. I love you guys. Thank you. Uh, they're very passionate about the things. I found them through uh, just random channels. You know what I mean? Like, it's cool. Like, I, I just love it because. No, you you fucking. Her name, Reinhardt. Like, I automatically go to fucking uh, Overwatch. And I thought about that the video that we saw last week. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Why? It sounds like we hate children every week. I know. Like, it's been every week because I got to throw in some fucking stupid ass joke. Right. You know, because it makes me uncomfortable that I don't have kids, you know? And- <laughs> And then when you leave, I cry to myself and I rock back and forth in the closet. Oh. Like I'm screaming at the wall like, what? <laughs> Not really. I'm just trying to make it silly. Um, anyway, <laughs> Patrick's losing it over here. He's crying. <laughs> Anyway, as I was going to say, the welcome to the team, guys. Really appreciate it. And for all of you that listen, please do check out the website. Uh, we do all of this shit ad free. We don't get paid for it. The podcast doesn't get shit for, for anything. Like we, we just do this because we're all passionate about horror and, uh, want to share it with people who are like minded individuals. So, uh, if you hear this episode, share it too, cause that really goes a long way as well. But it does, yeah. We had a, uh, Rebecca Reinhardt did an article, her first article this week. And uh, so did Eric Mifford. Player of the game. But, yeah. <laughs> so she did an article about should women support rape revenge films? And uh, originally it was something a little bit more mundane. It was like in defense of rape revenge films. And I was like, eh, it doesn't really. I always like asking questions of people. Like, Maybe you should ask a question, whatever you want to say. And like I gave her like a suggestion and then that's what she came up with. And then we put it up and like people are going ape shit over this stuff, guys. Like, yeah. like, like I think some people just read the title and go, what the fuck? Like they freak out. You know what I mean? Like they're like, oh, shit, Twitter, you better hold me back. You know, like because it just seems like people don't have that kind of attention span anymore. They just see that one thing, and they well, just it's wanna... okay. The thing, the argument that I keep coming across does. It's not that it was like they were like fuck rape revenge films or anything like that. It was more like women should be able to do whatever they want, and it was like right. That's not what we were saying. That's not what Rebecca was right. saying. But they, of course, they didn't read it to find None out. None of the ones that said that read the fucking article. Yeah, and I was like, come on, man. Like, of course, women should be able to watch. Or or you like why, whatever Alex? they want, just like any other person should be. You know why? You know why? Because that causes, you know, you need to put forth an effort. <laughs> well, <laughs> they no, don't want to put mean, forth that effort. I will admit it is a little bit of a clickbaity fucking title, but it's simple and to the point. And these days, you kind of have to be or nobody gives a shit about anything you say. Yeah. And those people just want to use that material to spin off and to talk about it in their I'm own I'm a good way. person. Yeah. I'm a good person. <laughs> Jesus, you're yelling in the mic. Dude. I'm sorry. Fucking my ears are bleeding. You're not a good person. I'm a good person. There you go. That's how you yell is off the mic. You know when I turn like this? Yeah, I know. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I just want to be a rock star. I just want to hold the mic. Yeah. A rocket. Dr. Satan! Dr. Satan! Ah, Dr. Satan! <laughs> Anyway, I'm not going to get into a tangent here, but it was a really good article. You guys should check that out, as well as Eric Mifford's. He did an article on, like, female body horror. So we're ve- we're very female-centric on the site this week, and I like it, actually, a lot. And uh, he gives a list of, like, all these new uh, f- films that have come out rec- of recent date that are very body horror-centric with female, uh, majority female well, of not the only cast. With, with horror anymore, it, it's it's transferred over to sci-fi and action as well. Oh, There's yeah. a lot of heroines out well, no, there now. He, body horror. There's a specific terminology genre, oh, okay, yeah, okay. subgenre called I body horror. Skimmed over that. Cronenberg automatically gets attached to that because right. he is one of the like 
you know, the godfather of fucking body whore. You know, he's like, <laughs> fuck it, you want to fuck a weird ass typewriter with well, you, a fucking butthole on You want to shove back? a nipple through your, your nipple? I mean, you want to shove a nipple through your nipple? You want to shove a pencil through your nipple? Watch this guy with the big penis face, like, drink out of a cup. Oh, it's with... fucking wacky, I tell you. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, guys, check him out. I just want to welcome everybody in case they listen to this episode because I really do appreciate it. And I'm really excited about all the new things that we're going to be putting out. So, um, but other than that, I think it might be that time. Oh, shit. Horse shots! So, uh, we decided to pick one of the two movies, um, Voices from Beyond and, uh, of course, The Wax Mask. And we decided to pick The Wax, the wax Mask this the week. The Waskoey Wowie. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's, uh, we, we came up with a shot called the wax heart and, uh, this is essentially a double shot, otherwise known as a sidecar, uh, for all you heavy drinkers out there or non-drinkers or whatever. Uh, but it's a half a shot of Grand Marnier because that is a French liqueur. So you're going to want to put a half a shot of Grand Marnier in there. And that is, of course, for the French, because this movie takes place in France, uh-huh. Paris, France, in the 1900s, like the uh, early, I think it was like ni- 1889 in the beginning of the movie, and then they fast forward it to like 1900, and, uh, you know. It was definitely after Jack the Ripper. Right. But it's also an Italian-made movie, so we thought, hey, why not put a little... Italiano. Yeah, a little flair in there with some uh, amaretto liqueur. So you're going to do a half a shot of amaretto, and then you're going to splash a little bit of lemon on the top. I would have, I would say to use a fresh lemon if you got one, but if not, a little lemon juice, little lemon juice will do, a little dab, dab will do, do you. Yeah. <laughs> a little dab will do, you. <laughs> and then uh, after you're done, here comes the fun part. By you're the going way. to fill up another shot. Uh, I you really sidecars are smaller, I believe. Sort of. It doesn't like, have to be a full shot. It doesn't a- have to be, but I mean, it's absinthe, so you might as well just take the shot. But just you know, you know take do, the shot, take the ride. Do your absinthe where you 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 pour it over sugar and burn it and all that other shit. Um, with absinthe, if you don't know how to do it, look it up. Um, get some opium to drip over the sugar cube. Then you're gonna slam the Grand Marnier and amaretto liqueur first, and then you're gonna chase it with the absinthe, and then after you're done, well. Before you take the shot, technically, you say, to Fulci. To Fulci. So, because this is uh, his, uh, kind of his episode in a way. Yeah. Even though it shares it with, like, Stivaletti and Argento, so. I love Argento, dude. Oh, I love his shit. Yeah, so. I, real quick, though, before we move on, we got a little shooters here. All right. I'm going to shoot it up. So, Patrick brought us some uh, interesting shit here I, did, again. I didn't bring cinnamon this week. Yeah, but what the fuck is this? I've never even heard of ice. I, it was... I don't know. It's a company called Ice, and it's Watermelon 101, which it is 50.5% alcohol by volume, which means that it's 101 proof. Yeah, baby. That's why it's 50.5. What should we do first? The the watermelon or the, the Southern Comfort? Uh, I'll drink the Southern Comfort later. I'm not a fan. You're not a fan? If this tastes terrible, then I'll drink it. How about that? I like Southern Co- Well, now that I know that, I won't get it. I don't like cherry cherry liquor. Oh. It's, uh, it tastes weird to me. All right. Well, if it's mixed with something, that's different, but... To fault you, baby. Cheers to our watermelon shot. <laughs> to fault you, baby. To fault you. Oh. oh. That's actually kind of nice. Uh, define Nice. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I got to the bite. Oh. Yeah, it's that fl- artificial flavoring. It, it took a while to hit. Ugh, it's a little too much. Like, I'll drink it. I mean, the alcohol's not supposed to taste perfect, but... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Did you want some of this water? No, I got some beer. I'll just chase it with some beer. Yeah, we're drinking it's not like hooligans as- here. We got Mickey's. It's not as bad as the fucking cinnamon shit that no, you dude, fucking... No, dude, that was so strong. Anyway, guys, if you would like to try the Wax Heart. All you have to do is go to longlivethevoid.com and check out our hashtag horror shots section now. That's it for horror shots. And now we're going to go ahead and jump into our flesh. And potatoes. (laughs) (laughs) Of Voices from Beyond. And the Wax Mask. Right now.
we were going to kick off with the wax mask first. If for some reason you want to skip this movie and move on to the wax mask, we always have our time stamps down below so that you know when any of the movies are talked about, when the spoiler section comes up. If you want to skip to any of those parts at any of the times, please feel free to do that. Anyway, so Patrick, why don't you kick it off with... So we're going to kick this off with 1991's Voices from Beyond. So the story is, when a family man is poisoned to death, it's covered up as a stomach hemorrhage, and his spirit returns to aid his daughter in finding his killers. Oh my god. I know, scary. <laughs> so it, it's directed and uh, written by Lucio Fulci, mm-hmm. who's, a, you know, we all know his work. Yeah, well, <laughs> you might want to list a few off. You know, City of the Living Dead, Zombie, The New York Ripper, Manhattan Baby. Yeah, there's a lot. There's yeah, I can keep. He's going. He's considered one of the masters of horror. If you don't know him, you should be fucking knowing him. Yeah, he's like our Wes Craven, almost. I don't know. He is a different kind of director. He's very different. Than, I'm just saying, than, as popularity goes. Right. Okay. He wrote the screenplay and the story. Mm-hmm. So, but the, also accompanied by Pero Regnoli, and the story was Daniel Stropa. Yeah, she also did the next movie we're going to be talking about too. Did she? She helped write that one as well. Oh wow. Yep. It's, uh, starring. Duelio del Prete. Yeah, it's pretty damn good, Patrick. And uh, he hasn't done much horror movies, but in this movie, he plays Giorgio, the far- the father. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of the movies he's well known for, which aren't horror movies, mm-hmm. are At at Long Last, Love, My Friends, Daisy Miller. I haven't heard of these. They're obviously, Yeah, Italian. a lot of these movies I haven't heard from the actress or actors in this movie. In this movie or the next, so. And then we also have Karina Huff, mm-hmm. who plays... Rosie, his daughter, and she was in The House of Clocks, Demon Six. I like that movie, actually. I haven't seen it. Is it good? I was thinking about doing it this week, honestly. Like, I like it. I re- I think we did it once in the past, but it was like when we weren't really giving attention to each movie individually as much. We were doing right. like we were just so many. Like, yeah, like glossing over. Rattle them off yeah, almost. Yeah. Uh, but those are pretty much the only horror movies she did. And uh, Wait, so- what did she do again? She did The House of Clocks and Demon Six, Del Porifondis. Profundus. Profundus. Yeah. A Demon Six. Yeah. Oh, well, that's right. They were they were trying to attach a bunch of names to it after. Really? I remember that, yeah, because like everybody they wanted to grab onto that fucking fame of the demons because like that was like big over here in the States. Yeah. Yeah. It's fuck it's a great franchise. I mean, I love Demons One and Two. Well, I mean I didn't know it went up to six. I wouldn't really consider anything past two part of the franchise, although the church is loosely a connected. Connected and right. I would probably that'd be as far as I would accept. That's almost it, like yeah. a, a prequel if you Yeah, that's Mich Michele Sove uh Suave. Sorry. Suave. Yeah, Michele Suave, uh, who did that one, and he's... I thought that was a good movie. But anyway, continue on. Oh, the church is great. Um, So we also have Pascal Persiano, who plays Mario. He's also known for Pagani Horror and The Sweet House of Horrors. Yeah, another Lucio Fulci film, TV, yeah. TV, made-for-TV movie. We also have Paolo Poloni, and he's also... He, was, he played the grandfather, and he's known for Cannibal Holocaust, The Haunting of Hela, Helen... Helena? Oh, wow. I didn't even realize that was him. And uh, Inferno. Huh. Nice. Okay. Which is the sequel to Suspiria. Yeah. Yeah. Which I actually like that one. Yeah. Um, it's, it's weird, but it's it's not Suspiria. I think the only one good. I didn't really like was- Well, we uh, did the three trilogy. We did right. the trilogy. Yeah, yeah. With Mike. Mother of Tears, yeah. Inferno, It, it gets and worse Suspiria. as it goes on, but that, that one's actually pretty notable. I think the last one was- uh, Mother of Mother Tears. Mother of Tears, yeah. Because yeah. mm-hmm. that was like a, a late 90s movie. As far as the budget goes on this film, we really don't know. Yeah, it doesn't really say too too much. I don't think. No, it, it was. A, it is a, a made for TV movie. Yeah, well, as a lot of uh, Fulci's films were towards the end there. Yeah, a lot of the Italian cinema stuff kind of started to die down around the nineties. Yeah, uh, it was really big in the eighties. You know, they were like really having it, but then all of a sudden, just like all the like people who were paying money for these kind of films just backed out. Oh, yeah. They just considered it shit. And then all the investors just started backing out. So they weren't getting the money that they used to have and the big production crews that they used to have. So it's it's really weird. I don't know. It's like I really kind of hope in some way that like there's a little bit more of a resurgence. Yeah. Because like, man, there's just so many great fucking Italian horror films. I mean, great is debatable for for each individual. But uh, no, I, I there's definitely like when you see a Fulci film, 
you know it's Fulci. Well, I don't know about that, actually. I mean, some of his later work is very debatable as whether or not it was even him. And there's even talk of people saying that he used his well, he, name sometimes. Right. Well, sometimes, well, didn't he also have a, an alternate name that he used? No, no, he the- wasn't one of those people. At least I don't remember. He might have early on, but later on he used it very proudly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think later on, there's movies like, I think it was like Zombie 3, where or was it Zombie 2? Yeah, it was Zombie 3, where he did some of the direction, and then they kicked him out, but he was also kind of sick, too, right. and they were shooting in, like, Burma or some fucking shit like that, but, yeah. So, it's, it's really debatable on whether some of his other, earlier stuff is, but, yeah. Anyways, so, uh, what'd you think about this film, Alex? Uh, well, I actually thought it was okay. <laughs> it's okay. So, a naked guy... Stabs a crying kid in the chest repeatedly. <laughs> this is like oh, wait, beginning. you've heard this one? Yeah. Oh, okay, because that's the name of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I mean, not to be disrespectful. It's it's just, it's weird because I've been a big lover of horror for a very long time. Since I was a little kid, you know, turning away from the screen, you know, because I was scared. But, you know, I've always looked back to see the next bit. You know, I'd be like, oh, my God, that's too much. And then I look back. You like look through the cracks of your hands like, wait a minute. What, right. What's going on? And it wasn't until Lucio Fulci's City of the Living Dead that I became a big like an actual fan. Yeah. You know, like I was a huge fan, but it wasn't until Fulci came along that I saw it that I was like really into it. I think the one that really turned me on to horror was it had to be Hellraiser was the first. Really? Film. OK. Yeah. I mean, I, I've always been a, like like wanting to see horror and then actively seeking out horror or two different things mm. to me. You know what I mean? That's the difference between being a fan and like not being a fan is when you start to aggressively make it a part of your life. That's why I say that's when I became a fan. Right. I, it's not that I didn't have movies that were like that when I was a kid or watch them all the time. I watched them since I was like four fucking years old. You know what I mean? But that film, The City of the Living Dead, is the film is that is my favorite of Fulci's. Because of that, I don't see pretty much that ever changing because of that first experience that I had. I like a lot of his other films, of course, so I've got a lot of respect for Fulci's films. He's never been too deep in the storytelling department, though, although sometimes he will surprise you in some of his films. He's a man that's done, like, so many different styles of of movie. You know, he's done just about every genre you can think of. So, but with that said, I have seen a few that I wasn't fond of. And I mean, what director pretty much doesn't have a portfolio with a couple turds. With a know. couple of turds in it here and there. And and granted, this is a guy that was like banging them out. You know, like during the 80s, there was some movies he was just constantly, they were just banging out movies. Like, man. Uh, who am I thinking of? I could, oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. The guy pumps out so many fucking movies. He did Death Race. He did... Corman. Corman. Yeah, Roger Corman. Yeah. But this film, even on the cover of the, of the Code Red release, says Fulci's last great film. Although... I mean, he had had his name used, like I mentioned before, on other films. Like, they just kind of... He was like, we really want to sell this. We yeah. Why am I putting your name on it? Pretty much. So I wonder if this one was a completely him. Although there is a thing in the movie that we'll get into in the spoilers that kind of makes it seem like it is. So, But I can't say. So... Um, like you mentioned, it's a straight to video, straight to TV film. It's often scrutinized, which I think is fair sometimes with some of his films, because like some of the later ones, it is a little debatable. Uh, although some of his earlier work, like Don't Torture a Duckling, um, which is kind of, you know, he's done some Giallo work. Uh, you know, it's, it's some of it's pretty great, actually, if you look at it as it is and not as a gore fest, like Zombie, City of the Living Dead, for, you know, The Beyond, things like that. So, which he's mostly known for, you know. Uh, I'm a fan of his gore and atmosphere, but I can't help but wonder if he kind of sort of felt trapped by that at one point in his life creatively. So, and the reason I'm kind of sort of telling you this is, you know, sometimes the work we create and love the most isn't always the stuff people appreciate most. And I just feel like this movie in particular, Voices from Beyond, feels like an odd mix. It's really weirdly mixed. It is, isn't like, it? If I had to label it, I would call it like an Italian supernatural whodunit. It, it almost, it, at some points, it feels like a Lifetime movie. Right, it's weird. <laughs> it does have some 
kind of atmosphere at some points, but not really. It has a little bit of gore. It's like the film just throws in some pretty odd gore moments to satiate his popular fan base while actually trying for something a little bit more unique. Which pretty much all those sequences were dream sequences. Right. Yeah, they kind of are. I mean, it is it's like a ghost and detective work mixed with like those dream sequences that you're talking about that trailers always love to add in, you know, to make the film seem like it's more than it actually is. Right. Because when we saw the trailer for this. And boy, did we fall for it, right? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, that's essentially this film in a nutshell. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's definitely not the last good Fulci film, in my opinion, but it's decently interesting film. Nonetheless, essentially, it's about a rich dickhead of a father that dies mysteriously and the family swarms to get his inheritance. Not the most original concept, but hear me out because he dies and then haunts the family, which is weird. And then his daughter tries to solve the mystery instead of going to the cops, <laughs> essentially. But that's about it. It's pretty hard not to spoil this movie, but if you're looking for the next zombie, the next beyond, the next city of the living dead, you ain't gonna find it here. And if- like what I thought when I first heard this movie, I thought it was loosely connected to the beyond or beyond. It's not. If you're looking for like a sort of a whodunit mix with like dream sequences, this is probably an okay movie for you. Not the best whodunit either, as it was a bit obvious as to who it might be. Yeah. Uh, it's watchable, and if you haven't seen it, it's not a terrible watch, but it's kind of disappointing. Feels like it was made in the 80s, though, which is kind of cool, you know, with all the lighting and the angles yeah. and stuff like that. The music by Stelvio Cipriani was not very good at all. Really? Oh, dude. I didn't like, like I was going to say it. not all of it, but like uh, all some right. of it was like some of the most redeeming qualities of this movie, in my I, opinion. I didn't like it too much. I, and I'm pretty much of that's one of the staples of Fulci's films is the music that yeah. goes along with it. So. I won't say all of it, but I, some of it did catch my ear. And I was like, oh, I like what he's doing. He's the guy that actually did music in Nightmare City and Piranha 2, The Spawning. He's not terrible in those, but unfortunately, it's just not all that great for me in this movie, to be honest. I will say some pieces are not that great, but some are pretty good. I I had much higher hopes for Voices from Beyond going into this for sure. I think, you know, people who probably have seen this film and own it are more just getting it for the completing their Fulci kind of collection. Yeah. And saying they saw it at least, you know. Plus, it's it's kind of interesting and oddly telling about a few things in Fulci land about this movie by the end. And we'll get into that more in the spoiler section. But as far as what I like about Fulci, it's not the worst thing ever. Uh, I'd probably give it like a four maybe a 3.5 out of 10. If you appreciate the man enough, you won't hate it. However, if you don't, well, it probably won't ever be for you. (laughs) You know, it wasn't exactly a sterling experience for me. Yeah. But it did do something unique, so I have to give it a little credit. You can definitely tell this was a made-for-TV kind of movie. Right. Well, I don't know. I was surprised that they they went as far as they did in some respects, but... Well, it's a a different place Some of the gore, like, you know, but I guess it is Italy, so... Yeah. What about you though? What did you think? Yeah, I'm kind of on the I'm, I'm kind of on the same lane. I, I I didn't maybe as like it as much as you did because I would have scored it maybe like a three, okay, or, or three point five. But I'm leaning more towards three. <laughs> I've just seen a lot of really terrible films, and uh, it's, I know it's you not definitely that seen bad. more. You know, so bad it's good than I have. Well, it's not even so bad it's good. It, it, yeah, it's this not. is not a so bad it's good. It, it's just kind of bad. It's not the best thing ever. Some of the dialogue is very humorous. Even though they're trying to be serious, it's just <laughs> it's just so funny, right? It's just hard not to laugh. Uh, a lot of the the horror or gore that does happen in this film are dream sequences. Nothing. All I, the I, good parts are really. Yeah, right. Anything that's good that happens is pretty much a dream sequence. Like Alex pointed out, it is a who done it, but it is painfully obvious who did it. For the most part, I mean, they kind of make you guess, re-guess yourself a little bit. Because those movies usually do, right? Maybe for, like, the first half an hour of the film. Yeah, maybe. But then you kind of, like, piece it together. And you're like, right. yeah, all right. Yeah. yeah. One person is very angry in this movie. Uh, yeah. And it's like, you. It, I almost was like, are they trying to tell me that this is this person? Or is it really this person? Yeah. Because they always pull that shit. Usually the most loudest, obvious person is not the one that does it. Right. Like, But in this 
this case. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little different. Yeah. But uh, I know Alex didn't like some of the music in this film, but for me, it was probably one of the most redeeming things about this film. Yeah. And maybe just because I like that obscure sound that he he tries to do in some points. I mean, not all the music is gold. Yeah. But there's some of it that it really caught me. I can't see myself going back to this film. Yeah. And reflecting fondly on it. It's just one of those one and done for me. Yeah, I'll add it to my collection when it's $10. <laughs> I would even pay $10 for it. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, it would never be more than that, you know? Because, yeah. like, right now it's like $35, $40. Yeah, suck a dick. Because they keep making it go out of print, and then Code Red puts it back up, so. Yeah, they're fishing. They got the line. I don't there. know. They're fishing. So, uh, uh, would I suggest any of you viewers out there to go out to watch it? If you're a Fulci guy. Uh, it, it's one of his last films. If you appreciate his work that much, then yeah, go ahead and give it a watch. I don't think it's great. It's not great. I don't think it's good. I think it, I don't even think it's average. It's worth a chuckle if you want to have some very corny dialogue thrown in your face and have a little chuckle at. Then yeah, there's definitely a lot of that. <laughs> Enjoyment factor is very low on this one. Yeah, there are some okay things in it though. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Like I said, three, three point five, right? Maybe. That's fair. I mean, that's fair. It's it's unfortunate. Like I was kind of excited about it, but I guess I should have not been. It was like he was pandering to his his real fan base while trying to tell some other story. Yeah. So, um, don't blame us if we don't like it. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. No, I mean it's hard to watch, but it is up on on uh, Amazon Prime. But unfortunately, this is the weirdest thing too. It's in 1080p, but it stutters. Like it's it's only like they recorded it and put it up as 24 frames per second. I remember you saying that, and too. it felt like it was stuttering the whole fucking time. Like I could totally tell, and I don't know what the fuck why it was, but it's also up on YouTube as well. Which for, where is where I watched it? Right, like I played it on the other for like 20 minutes and i was just like christina i can't handle this i was like <laughs> how I bad s- was it that br- it was really that yeah bad. i was like i'd rather watch it in 720p yeah than watch it stutter because i felt like i was gonna seize out for any minute you know what i mean <laughs> not from the poor dialogue or story but just from the fucking stuttering yeah <laughs> anyway uh so yeah let's jump into some of this I mean, as far as uh, the factoids for this film, I didn't find much. Okay. But we know that Lucio Fulci is the uh, doctor who does the autopsy of the father at the beginning. Yeah. Which was cool. Yeah. I, I, he always usually does do like a kind of a... Like a cameo or something. Yeah, like a little bit. He's always a doctor or some sort of fucking like theologian or some so who shit. Who am I thinking of that does that a lot uh well, there's other many people have done it for years. It's just kind of a thing. Yeah. A lot of times it's mostly because like they don't have somebody for the part. So they're like, I'll do it. Whatever. Let's just get it on. And the only other thing I have, I found really because I tried to dig a little bit was that uh, I, I read somebody else's review on this film and uh, they kind of said that this had maybe the story maybe influenced and mirrored his life a little bit at the time. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was kind of interesting because I didn't know it was his last film, but yeah. Well, I have a little bit on that towards the end when we get to the scenes of the stuff that I okay. saved. So, well, that's pretty much all I have, sir. Uh, well, I was just curious because that's just me when I watch these movies. I just want to know more. I know. So, the source material for Voices from Beyond was based on a short story published by the uh, Gazeta de Rins, uh and later included in an anthology of Fulci short stories titled Le Luna Nier which was published in 1992, but it was supposed to be written with the intentions of developing it, developing it into a screenplay for the film. And Fulci turned to the screenwriter, Piero Regnoli, to work on the script, who also worked on Demonia, which is another crazy film that it's, it's okay. Like, there's one really cool scene in it. Yeah. That everybody likes. Is it good enough to, like, go out and just watch um, it? It just depends. If you're a gore hound, you're probably not going to like it that much. Uh, you'll have one moment of, of glee, and then you'll just be like, whatever. Go limp dick. Yeah. Uh, but did, Fulci did speak about the film, stating that he loved it very much. He said it was a wonderful movie with the wrong cast, specifically describing Karina Huff as unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> the daughter? Yeah, he said oh. Del Prete is completely out of the role. The mother in law is too wicked, and you understand immediately that she is the killer, which he's right. He, yeah. He's right. Um, this is the spoiler section, guys. So if you don't want anything spoiled, I would skip this part, go on to the next uh, movie 
timestamps down below. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I have a little bit of extra that I tucked into some of the scenes that we talked about that I thought was kind of interesting. Nothing that much. This movie is kind of a miss anyway, so there's not going to be a whole lot of backstory on this movie, but I usually find these kind of films very interesting because there's always some extra story as to why it got made and why they say what they said, because there's a thing that they say at the very end of the movie that we'll talk about when we get into our scenes. So so what do you think about some of these scenes in this film? Well, immediately, the guy who stabs his son. Because <laughs> he's crying. Yeah, because he's crying. He's like, I want my mommy. And he's like, stop it. Stop it. And he just stabs him. I'm like, what What does that even mean? <laughs> right. Like, and, and, and you find out later on, because they replay it a couple of times, why it is. But that same guy, what's his name? I don't know how they fucking say, say it. Whatever. We're going to call him Greg from here on out, because I just don't want to fucking fight with it, because I don't remember. <laughs> um, but and we're not fluent in Italian either. Yeah. The same guy, of course, is just the wife's dream. Of course, doing this. But the next scene is him in a hospital bed, spitting up blood and dying. And his wife is crying over them, doing an odd autopsy on his body because of, uh, course, they suspect foul play. Which is, in my opinion, probably one of the best scenes of the whole film is the autopsy. You think? Oh, yeah. I definitely think. Well, I mean, the, the, this she wasn't crying over him at the autopsy. No. She was crying over the fact that they wanted to do an autopsy is what I meant to say, I guess. But they do do an autopsy later on because but but she's upset because, you know, they suspect foul play, which, you know, she returns home, she hears his voice commanding her. Like, I don't remember exactly what he says, but she thinks it's him, and then it's like, nah. It's just fucking Margaret with the fucking TV too loud playing a scene that he acted in or was in some TV show. Goddamn fucking Margaret and her fucking stupid loud TVs. You know, like why? How many times? Like, why in the fuck would you believe that that was your your fucking? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's just like a writer's like overthought. Mm -hmm. Like you can never mimic the bass and the voice of somebody. I guess if you bounce it off enough walls, you might think it was. But and who the fuck plays a tv that loud for it to be even that real it would echo through the whole house and she would know the difference exactly but yeah, anyway it's a little sloppy but whatever the the other thing that struck me was like how the the step grandmother takes joy in this and tells the father of uh gorgio giorgio uh who died that he's dead like she's ye yelling at this fucking old man in a wheelchair who can't move can't think can't do anything well i think he could think he's like stricken with like uh, some he's like a conscious dementia inside of her shell something. yeah but he's like there's like he's like onset of dementia yeah and he can't speak he can't move he can't look anywhere he just stares while this old woman is fucking yelling at him and she's laughing about her she's like your son Dead, your by favorite the way. son. Just... Your favorite son. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow, she did it. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but, like, it's just dark. I don't know. That was something about it. Uh -huh. Like That girl is a really good actress. The the one that plays the step-grandmother. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. She annoyed me, though, a little bit. Well, she's doing her job. But this is kind of where the movie turns into the whodunit part. Yeah. Because, you know, you, it's like the supernatural whodunit story that I was talking about. You know, with the dead guy's voice begging for help constantly. Like, help me, Rosie. <sighs> help me. Wait. Oh, I can't even do it. Help me, Rosie. Please help me. You have to help me. He's like talking to each of the fucking family members and they can't hear him. And it's like, it's and like you sort of find out, like I mentioned, that he was a huge douche, by the way, to everyone except his daughter. Um, and that many people have many motives to want to kill him because he's such a fucking prick. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. Like, he was nice to her, so that's why. But she had to know that he was a fucking prick to everybody. He exactly. cheated on the fucking everybody. He fucking ripped people off. He treated them like garbage. And it's like, yeah, your dad died, but, like, you have to recognize that. Do you think maybe Fulci felt that way about himself when writing this? Well, we'll get into that later a little bit because, like, yeah, I think that there is a little bit of that going on. Um, I think what he was trying to say maybe is that they deserved it and that the people that that he was mean to might have deserved it yeah so it's weird though because he was like thinking about his mortality in some way in this this film so it's very telling that's why i say that yeah it, it seemed like it but yeah basically they all just want his money 
right? So, well, except his daughter, Rosie, obviously, who somehow knows he is talking to her, but they don't really explain it. She has these dreams. And he's like, I'm alive as long as you think of me. (laughs) Remember the lake over here? Remember that one time I actually spent time with you when I was fucking that broad in the shed that your mom hated me for? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, what the fuck? How funny. Was the picture of her and her dad on the lake? And he's like kicking up the leg. And kind of, it just seemed very comical. To yeah, me. there was some pretty funny <laughs> going on there. But yeah, that that I just thought that was weird. I guess he explains to her how he can only exist because she thinks of him, and that's how people exist outside of death. Mm. Is because either anger or love, or maybe that their body is still decaying. Like, maybe well, they do make the it body, a point about yeah, that. Yeah. Once the body's completely decayed, maybe the soul is released or something. Something. They do kind of, yeah, they show him degrading over yeah. the time, you know, which, you know. You and he's think, like, hurry, time is running out. Yeah, right, Rosie, time is running out. <laughs> like, fuck a Jesus. But yeah, that night, the uncle has a dream where zombies attack him in a mortuary, which is part of the reason why we wanted to watch this, right? Yeah. Immediately, right away, when I saw him in a mortuary, I was like, ah, here it is. This is going to make no sense. But it it seemed like a mashup of zombie, ghost, and, you know, a whodunit. It just seemed like a crazy mashup that we wanted to watch and ended up being a turd sandwich. Well, and that's the funny thing is that the uncle is actually sleeping with Greg's wife. Yeah. Uh, the one, Greg is the guy who died, but he's sleeping. The, the uncle is sleeping with his wife and they were sleeping together before he died. So this is why it makes him okay to be a bad person, I guess. <laughs> why Greg's okay to be a fucking dickhole <laughs> to every person he meets, including his like mistress. Yeah. You're just a product to me. Go away from me. Get out of my view. Stupid whore. Yeah. Like, what the <laughs> fuck, dude? Like, Like, it doesn't paint... I don't feel compassion for him. No. And I think that's what's missing in this movie, is that I don't feel compassion for the guy that died who whose daughter is trying to solve the mystery of this fucking prick of a father. Like, why would you do that? Like, why would you add a fucking prick-ass father? I don't know. It's weird. So that's why... Yeah. I, I don't mean to be mean, because if this is him, like Fulci, I have mad respect for the guy, but that's just weird, man. Like, yeah. I know it's different, at least, but I don't know. But they go back to the to to that sequence, and he sneaks out of the room with Rosie's uh, aunt or Rosie's mom Mm -hmm. and she's like she sees him sneaking out she's like get out before anybody sees you because he yells from waking up from that zombie dream which is like just a bunch of zombies pour out of this mortuary out of the fucking is it a mortuary is yeah it's like the it's like the the fucking place that like phantasm has right where they have the the people buried in the wall there's a word for it and I just can't mausoleum mausoleum there we go that's what i was thinking of i don't know though i can't i don't know what the difference is is right off the top of my head unfortunately if you guys know go ahead sound off but they go back to the dream sequence of uh giorgio killing his own son so they kind of like show more this time because i guess he was on to the fact that his wife was cheating on him with his brother and they had a kid and she kept saying it was giorgio's son but really, he always felt like it was his brother's, and he hated him for it. So he was Which just... Which it really wasn't his brother. It was his stepbrother. Right. But, you know, that's what I kept thinking. Is it really his son? Right. You know, she's obviously been sleeping around, so... Hmm. Mm. Then they, uh, you know, they did the uh, autopsy. Uh, they're, they're, it takes some days for some reason to do the autopsy. I, I don't know why. They, they, they waited two days to do the autopsy. Yeah, I don't know what that's all about. But then somebody, you see some woman... Like, they show her hands, no gloves, no nothing, straight up woman. They don't show her face, but they show that it's a woman. And she just crashes the fucking, the samples. Um, They pulled out, like, some of his organs to see right, why to he see died. What, yeah. And, like, she sabotages this out. But, you know, she finds this out because Rosie's friend, who's her boyfriend, I guess, works at the hospital as a fucking, like, he's, like, a student. And, like, part of the test is that they get to test samples, too, from other stuff. It's just, like, part of it. And he was like, yeah, they found glass in his body. And they were like, well, that's because the... that somebody sabotaged the samples. And he was like, no, when I took the samples, it was 
It hadn't been sabotaged yet. And it was like, ding. And he's like, we should go to the police. She's like, no, wait. <laughs> Susie Sleuth wants to go around and fucking ask some questions from the family to find out what the real story is. Because all the cops are going to do is scare everyone away. They will never suspect me. So, and... <sighs> You, you know, one of my favorite scenes is w- 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 the part we're getting at is when she goes around and talks to all her family members. She goes to her father's <laughs> mistress and finds out where she lives because she asked right. her mother about it. I thought that was a funny scene, dude. Yeah, she's like crying in agony about like the story and how she w- wish he would die. And then when he did die, you know, she felt remorse for that. And like she straight up asks her. She's like, did you put glass in his food? Yeah. And cuz they went to dinner, the mistress and him went to dinner that that night. That yeah. night when he died. She's like he was so selfish, he was a piece of shit. Right. Like he just treated me like garbage and I loved him so much and I just don't understand. Yeah, and at this See, point my mother told me that it, <laughs> that part cracked me up too. Rosie just books it. Yeah, she just walks out. She's still in mid sentence and, and she's, she's just out the door. And and the fucking mistress is just talking. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't stop. <laughs> yeah, like she gets in the car, she drives down eating a sandwich, and you can hear the fucking mistress talking in the background. Yes, my mother told me that I was la 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 la. And she was like, yeah, this bitch didn't do it. But she's already in the cab she's driving like, yeah. away. She's like, I already know that she didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> this bitch is crazy. Um, now it's time for, of course, another weird dream sequence for Rita, the mistress, uh, and Giorgio in some like weird room where they have like these fake mannequin things with like organs hanging down. Like, Which is another them. decent scene. Yeah, like, it was it was surreal. Yeah. Like Giorgio blames her and he's like, you're the one that killed me. And he's like, here, I've got sunny side up eggs for you that she looks at. And all of a sudden they turn into eyes like the uh, yolks turn into yeah. eyes. I love how like one splits perfectly and you could tell the other one just wouldn't pop. Yeah. Like, Son of a bitch. And it took him like four or five tries to like pop it. It looked pretty cool, though. It did. It looked like real eggs. It, but, it like, reminded me of uh, Elmer. Elmer? El- El- Elmer. 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 You talking about from uh, Frank Henlotter film? Yeah. Brain damage. Yeah, it reminded, yeah. Me of, it, it reminded me of brain damage a little bit. Yeah, that part. I guess. I it's mean, pretty silly fucking shit. But. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Later, this is the part that cracks me up. Earlier in the movie, just a little bit earlier, she sees her brother like playing with a mortar and pestle, <laughs> which is like a bowl with a fucking... Like, it's like what they crush up medicine in. Right. To mix medicines and put them into capsules. They smash it over and over. And she just sees him. And she's like, what are you doing? Well, we're going to have to find you a new toy. And then later on, after the Rita dream sequence, she sees him, her little brother, her half brother, brother, whatever. He's like crushing up light bulbs in that mortar and pestle like a psycho. And like, (laughs) she's like, where did you learn a thing like that? (laughs) (laughs) Like, wait now, the kid's a suspect? Like, what the fuck is happening right Right. now? Which, to be honest, had they gone that route, I would have liked this movie more. Had it been the the, the if kid, they added a little bit more mystery to it instead of right. just like well, because outright. Here's the thing: the, the the father who died, who got murdered, is a prick. I don't care about how he died or who killed him anymore. It's just like, well, whatever. So if it just happened to be some weird fucked up little kid that happened to put glass in his ice cubes and he swallowed them and fucking drank it and then died that way, that would have been incredibly better than the fucking story we got. Yeah. You know, it's so obvious, you know, I don't know, but I thought it was really funny. Like (laughs) she's like, it's like, no, it's not him. Rosie's calling out her mom to meet up at an undisclosed location because she thinks that the mom set the little boy up to do this for her. And that's when another new dream sequence happens of her getting ice for her father as a child and all these ice cubes shoot out of the fucking refrigerator like like a lot. Yeah. But it was kind of a cool sequence. It's it weird. It definitely was cool looking. You know, you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of that scene in City of the Living Dead when the glass breaks and she's painting that rhino. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it yeah. sticks into the picture and bleeds. Like, it kind of reminded me of that for some odd reason. So it kind of makes sense there a little bit. But my mind was fucking blown, though, when she realizes that it was the kid. And she was like, oh, my God. 
But then she's like, oh, it was taught to by her gra- his grandmother. Mm-hmm. So it was the grandmother who set the child up to do this for her so that she wouldn't get blamed. And it's like, ah, oh, come on, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, make it the kid. That would have been so much cooler. So can you imagine if the kid did it all along with no help? Yeah, with no like that would have been some fucking like next level shit, dude. That would have given that would have made this movie at least a four point five, maybe a five. Like for me, just that alone, just because I would have definitely like, would have spiced things up because it wasn't so on the nose, right? Then she goes back, she goes to talk to her grandmother, and she's like, "I know you did it." Yeah, and which was another stupid scene, like where she's like, "You can have the house, you can have the money, you can have it all," and. What was her whole point of it? Like, I like it. I'll tell you what it says. Basically, I thought th- I thought this was actually a pretty kind of poetic sort of shot and scene. It's like she's like there's this, like Rosie is like I'll give it to you all. I don't care, but you're gonna be haunted by your decisions for the rest of your lives. You know, like you killed him right. all for this fucking house, and you can have it because I don't even want to be a part of this fucking house anymore. You can have it all. And you're going to fucking you're going to pay for your sins because he's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. And then she shuts this metal door that looks like a fucking jail cell shuts. And you see the grandmother like crying and weeping. And I thought that was kind of a little poetic shot. It's definitely poetic. Just just that shot. Like not the movie. Just, you know, I thought that was a good use of everything at that point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I thought, you know, I thought it was cool. So. I don't know. It's just weird how fucking Rosie gets all crazy after that. Yeah, like right. The, yeah, where she goes to the graveyard. She's to just visit like her. laughing. It's like maniacal laughing too. Like she's plotting something. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Like, and I'm, 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 I'm really. And this is where we're going to talk about the whole Fulci um, putting himself into this movie a little bit. Uh, usually, you would think that if someone put themselves into it, it'd be a better movie. Yeah, they way. paint themselves in a better light. But I think it's because it's narrated or told in the way that is only significant to him maybe yeah very particular to his his particular situation almost as if to say that fulci is in some way gregorio or whatever greg giorgio 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 i mean a lot of people felt like he was kind of mean and pretty angry to work with you know it's not it's like a it's a pretty like a lot of different actors and you know to, and people who've worked with him have said that you know he had a temper a little bit so but when you, if you notice especially the scenes with his mistress like when she's recalling it later she's more seeing it clearly the way it was than Maybe. the way she remembered it and and it's weird too because like a lot of people really admired him even though he was kind of like that particular kind of guy you know yeah maybe he felt like people were out to get him in his dying days it could be. Part of the reason I feel that way is is that at the end of the movie, in the credits, guys, it says, this film is dedicated to my few real friends, in particular, Clive Barker. Yeah. And Claudio Caraba, signed Lucio Fulci. Like, hmm. Seems pretty obvious that there was some sort of resentment towards the end of uh, Fulci there, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, which is weird because I never knew that he was friends with Clyde Barker. I didn't either. And I, I don't, you know, I don't know what that's all about, really, to be honest with you. But I know that his his last part of his life, he wasn't, you know, some, you know, like he's a he's a horror master. Right. And you would think that these horror masters, oh, they're living in luxury. They're fucking doing well because we admire them so much. Yeah. But really, he lived a very humble, even Argento talks about how he didn't live in the best of conditions. When they met to do the wax mask, which we're going to be talking about next, he was like, yeah, it was kind of bad. You know, he wasn't doing that well. They had some beef early on because of movies that Fulci did that he felt like kind of ripped him off. Yeah. Argento. Yeah. So I don't know. He uh, apparently uh, Lucio Fulci died alone in his sleep. Uh, in his apartment in Rome at around 2 p.m. on the in the afternoon of March 13th in 1996 from diabetes related complications at the age of 68. Um, Fulci had lost his house and was forced to move into a small apartment. Since Fulci had been so despondent in the later years, some believe he may have intentionally allowed himself to die, but not by not taking his medications. But that's not true. Dario Argento actually spoke about it. And I'll get into more of that in the wax mask uh, trivia and stuff. So 
1996, though, Fulci made an appearance at a January Fangoria horror convention in New York City two months before he died. Walking on crutches with like a bandaged foot, I guess, he told attendees that he had no idea that his films were so popular outside of his native Italy. As hordes of starstruck gore fans braved blizzard conditions that weekend to meet him. Which I always find really fucking interesting that even artists who inspire so many other people always feel like they're never appreciated. Yeah. yeah. And that their work is garbage, even though they, they care about it so much. I guess, you know, it's just how things go. But it, it's kind of sad. Yeah, it is. For you sure. know? Uh-huh. But I guess, you know, art sometimes needs time to grow. For me, as a band, like in a band, I never even really like to play shows locally. Yeah. Because I always got way better response everywhere else. So it's weird. I guess, you know, him being in such an isolated place in Italy, he didn't really realize how big it was and how many fans he really did have. But I don't know. A lot of, f- a lot of, Really good films that grew up in cult status got a lot of shitty reviews when they came out, though. Like too. Evil Dead, right? Like The Thing. Yeah, it just—it's just one of those things. Sometimes it just needs to percolate in somebody's mind to realize, hey, this is a cult classic, and you just—you just don't realize it yet. But we have another film to talk about. The Wax Mask <laughs> came out. It actually aired in 1997. Um, technically it says 1996 online, but it's 97. Uh, it is also known as M.D.C. Machetta de Seda, which is just the wax mask. The story is Paris, 1900. A couple are horribly murdered by a masked man with a metal claw who rips their hearts out. The wax heart. Get it? Yeah. Right, now you do. You're okay. Clever. The sole survivor and witness to the massacre is a young girl. Twelve years later in Rome, a new wax museum is opened, whose main attractions are lifelike creations of gruesome murder scenes. A young man bets that he will spend the night in the museum, but is found dead in the morning. Soon, people start disappearing from the streets of Rome, and the wax museum halls begin filling with new figurines. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. So this movie was directed by Sergio Stivaletti. He's actually been the special effects, practical effects guy for most horror, Italian horror movies. He's actually pretty damn good, too. He's worked on films like Demons 1 and 2, The Church, Cemetery Man, Mother of Tears, The Card Player, and more. He's directed a few shorts and one that I have a poster for, but I never saw. It's called Profane Exhibit. It's an anthology where he did the Tofet Corum segment, which I haven't seen. If any of you guys have seen it, tell me if it's any good, because I need to find it and track it down. It's very rare. He's also directed Dogman's Rabies, The Phantom of the Opera from 1998, The Three Faces of Terror, and the soon-to-be-released Nightfall. The movie is, of course, based off of Gaston Leroux, who also is known for doing The Phantom of the Opera, but the story and the screenplay was mostly written by Lucio Fulci and uh, Dario Argento. So they worked. This was their collaboration. Got some information on that in the trivia that you're going to want to stick around for. The movie was written by Lucio Fulci, who worked on City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, House of the Cemetery, Don't Torture Duckling Zombie, and more, of course. And Dario Argento, who wrote and produced this movie as well. He's directed the famous Suspiria, Opera, Deep Red, Inferno, Mother of Tears, Tenebrae, and many more. You didn't even say Demons. That's one of your favorite films. He produced it. He didn't direct it. Oh. That's why I didn't say it, Patrick. Oh, I see. Now you feel dumb, don't uh, you? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody says that. It's a common thing because his name's at the top. Yeah. Well, settle up the mule, ma. <laughs> I got to get me some education. <laughs> uh, it also is written by Daniel Stro- Danielle Stropa, who joined on to help write. She was the one that also worked on Voices from Beyond. She also did Zombie 5 Killing Birds. The Crawlers, The House of Clocks, which is also a Fulci movie that aired on TV. We talked about a little bit, too, that I want to do soon, hopefully. Um, Delirium and uh, many more. 
some of the cast in this movie, I won't go through all of them because I, I think it's unnecessary because mostly I don't know a lot of the movies that they've done. Um, but it does have Robert Hossein, who plays Boris. He is a French actor who is also a writer and director. He's acted since the late 40s, actually, and he's done about 114 roles. He did Shadow of Evil, The Secret Killer, Double Agents, Bolero, The Bor- the Burglars, and more. He's also written a bunch of stuff, too. Like I think it was like 20-some credits, uh, including the 1992 version of Les Miserables. Also stars Romina Mondello. She's the the lead actress in this movie. She plays Sonia. She's been in a TV miniseries on BBC called Nostromo, uh, a TV movie called The Squad, and in Dogman's Rabies by Stavaletti too. Yeah, and I might add that she's quite a looker. Yeah, she well, is they, very pretty. They talked about it. They wanted to get somebody that was charismatic. Yeah, which technically means hot. I guess. <laughs> she's. I wouldn't say hot. I would say she's beautiful. Right. Okay. Whatever. I don't. <laughs> She is beautiful. Yeah, a lot of people felt so. Um, it also stars Ricardo Cerventi Longhi, uh, who plays Andrea. But he was in movies like Arachnicide, Symphony in Blood Red, The Three Faces of Terror, and more. It also stars Umberto Bali, who plays Alex, who I thought was pretty creepy in this movie. Uh, he did this movie in a movie called Three, and that's it. Literally wow. the number three, by the way. Was that like the... Uh pretty much the hunchback assistant yes <laughs> yeah uh also has gabriella giorgelli who who was in the movies uh she played the aunt the uh, mom of sonia i think mm. or something i don't know she was in the movie the beast women in cell block seven city of women hercules from 1983 and wild team this movie had a budget of three million buckaroonies no shit. Yeah, it's actually pretty big for, for this production, I think. But what are your thoughts on this movie, Patrick? This is your first time as well as mine, so. You know, uh, dude, I didn't know what to think at first. The trailer was phenomenal. But, like, as we've seen before, trailers right. can be very deceiving. Oh, yeah. But uh, everything, I think, was very on point in this film. I thought the set design was brilliant. I thought the props were brilliant. I thought the practical effects were on point. Right. It, it just, it hit on all cylinders. It was... It was good. I mean, for me, though, when I was watching this film, some of it, when I say some of it, I mean very loosely, some of it was in English. Because, uh, yeah, he watched one of the, like, original DVD copies. Right. So what I mean by that is that, like, literally three or four lines were in English and the rest were not. Yeah. It it was very limited on the English. Uh, There is a new copy out, though, by the way, from Severin uh, on Blu-ray, by the way, guys, if you guys are looking for this. And I'm willing to I might have to borrow your copy because I would like to watch it again in English. That's okay. I mean, you got the gist of it for the most part. I got the gist of it, but like sometimes the the subtitles went by so quickly. There's a lot of speaking in this movie. That's why. Yeah. You you probably should have paused it. That's what I do. I know. It was a beautiful looking movie. Okay. And I, and lots of little twists here and there. And especially, I don't want to give anything away, but the ending, a little bit of a twist there. And I didn't see it coming. And I love when films do that to me. Um, acting was on point. Like what did you I think said, of the gore? Did you like the gore? I love the gore. The gore yeah. was great. Like I said, everything was very good. That's all Stivaletti. Yeah. I mean, the, dude, the props that they made with this, this the set, is, like I said, it was just, it, it brought you to a place. Yeah. And it kept you there. There was no something that disconnected you from what was going on in this film. It kept you on that level all the way through. Yeah. Um, acting was good. Like I said, I can't wait to watch it all in English. And which, like I said, you're going to have to divvy up that. Don't bit. worry about it. Let me I, can't, I don't know if I'll let you borrow it, but we'll see. We'll see. All right. <laughs> let me get a little hand job or something. We'll get it, we'll get it done. Um, I'm a fucking stickler about my fucking movies. Dude. I know you are. Because I have loaned you movies, actually, and you have never given them back for for years. Remember I loaned you Versus? Uh, I did have Versus for, for a while. For two years, dude. For two years. I and did. it came back scratched. <laughs> that was in a dark period of my life. I'm sorry. Well, hey, I, now you know why I'm very hesitant. Yeah. I'm better about burn my me once, Chris Patrick. You know what I mean? <laughs> Shame on me. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a good film, and I definitely suggest. I, I definitely suggest anybody out there who who likes Lucio Fulci watch this film. Maybe not one of his best, but well, almost. he didn't direct it. He just wrote it. Right. 
Uh, what about you? What did you think about this film? Oh, I mean, I have a ton of thoughts on this. This is my first time in. and You, you wouldn't be you if you didn't have a ton of thoughts. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. I'm a little long-winded, but that's why we do podcasts now, don't we? <laughs> um, I, uh, I really, really actually enjoyed this movie. This is one of the movies that many years ago when it released, I believe it was like hard to get a hold of or something. I don't remember. I remember thinking of ordering this movie from one of those like out of print PAL to NTSC, like horror VHS places like video junkies or uh, I can't think, but never did or never got around to watching it. And I'm pretty glad that I did this time though. Uh, thanks to one of my friends and viewers of my Twitch streams, Patrick Lemke, Plemke as we call him. Oh, he Patrick. Per- yeah. He like purchased it for gym. me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's got good parents for naming him, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but thanks buddy. I really appreciate that, man. But seeing the talent, like Sergio Stivaletti in the director's seat while still giving his practical effects and uh, even some of the set design is almost like seeing Tom Savini do his Night of the Living Dead. Only Stivaletti was allowed to actually put gore in his film, which is very surprising when you think of the Night of the Living Dead. Um, I really like the gore in this. He's the guy who worked on Demons 1 and 2, Della Morte, Della Moore. You know, I mentioned it all before, but it's pretty great stuff to see. And it looks really awesome, mm-hmm. uh, especially in one particular scene or sequence, I should say. Some of it's a little schlocky, but you, you kind of expect that, you know, from these kind of films. Oh, yeah. Because it kind of has like a feeling of the 80s, but it's not like it was shot in the 80s like 80s feel while marinating it with that sort of gothic horror style from like the 50s and 60s oh yeah yeah yeah. like heavily which i loved and you can tell it's obviously borrowing from the phantom of the opera since it is you know gaston Leroux, so who wrote that work so i mean it's essentially the a remake of his work so almost like with a house of wax and the wax mask all together in one little thing. But it, it's technically a Giallo-esque styled horror movie mixed with what I mentioned before. And to me, that's actually not a bad one in my opinion. Like, I think it's actually a pretty decent one. And it's surprising because when I first started this movie, I kept hearing bad shit about it. But I think it was just because at that time, so many people in the 90s were just like all about fucking getting horror You know, they wanted to see Zombie. They wanted to see, like, Suspiria. They wanted to see all these, like, Deep Red and fucking all this other shit. Because these are the two horror maestros, you know what I mean? They're from Italy. So um, I wasn't expecting the level of quality that this film had to offer, to be honest. For one, like you mentioned, the wardrobe and the, like outfits and shit that they had in this movie are amazing and the killer is chic as fuck Mm -hmm. like with his tall collar black coat and brim hat fucking weird ass needle thing that he carries around yeah dude super fucking cool shit there dude dude. all the props were just fucking great there was a heavy attention to detail in this movie they did not slack on that at all and for a period piece that's pretty fucking important Mm -hmm. you know and for a movie that didn't even really have that much money that's pretty fucking awesome to be honest so even like i said the tools of destruction had they'd taken so much care with you know It, it really adds to the aesthetic and i'm not even a period piece fan by the way guys like, I fucking, I'm not, I really just don't get into them. I know some people do, and that's cool. It's just not for me. I like a little bit more modern telling, but I do like period pieces. There, see, there are those gems out when there. When it's done right. Yeah. And this is, to me, actually done really well. Right. Uh, like uh, From Hell. Like, yeah, From like, Hell was perfect. In there my is opinion. some movies that I will get into. I can't think of any off the top of my head just off right now, but. Um, the music and score in this is hell of a lot better than the last movie we just talked about, in my opinion. It's really good. It fits this movie perfectly. It helps set the atmosphere. It's got like this very gothic, very well done, orchestrated kind of piece going on here. Plus, you know, for a movie that was made in the mid 90s, it did a lot of things right that the 90s sort of lost on me. Mm hmm. Seriously, like yeah. it's 90s weren't the most popular horror thing going on it most pretty much killed horror in a lot of ways that's when i think action kind of pretty much took the forefront in well, america anyways. sci-fi action it, it just trades off every now and then you know yeah. what i mean and then until somebody comes along and like kicks it 
kicks it back, kick its heart back into fucking action. You know what I mean? But uh, I thought the acting is much better than I thought it would be. But it's kind of hard to tell because some of the atrocious voice dubbing uh, <laughs> matching the lips, you know, like the voice acting is good. It's just that it doesn't match the lips. So, you know, but if you're an Italian cinema fan, you should be pretty used to that by now. So I don't really think that's a valid argument to 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 shit on this film. Mm-hmm. Um it may be better to experience it in its native tongue and like watch it with subtitles. But like, as Patrick said, fuck man, it's hard to read that fast. So the characters though, I felt were really interesting though. And the look of them fit the roles pretty great. Mm -hmm. Uh, I honestly wasn't a big fan of the lead actress so much, but she, she did the role in my opinion. She's pretty. She's, you know, whatever it didn't beautiful. She didn't blow me away, but the guy who played Boris was fucking great. Um, there's some definite issues that uh, that happen in this movie, though. Ones that I think are pretty forgivable in the full spectrum of the movie. The third act goes a bit bananas, you know, so it's a little wacky. And they use some visual effects that were, how do I say, less than favorable to the film. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's to put it nicely, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, the story, even though it borrows from, you know, the, the original, uh, it's still pretty damn great. And one that I was not expecting, Fulci wrote the story and the screenplay for this one and a few others, of course. And I think he did a damn good job. He did the majority, the lion's share of the work on this. And everybody just kind of tweaked it after that. Um I think I think Fulci, if he had seen this film before he passed away, he would have been proud. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. he was apparently, I think, was supposed to actually originally direct it because uh, we'll get into that more. But Argento had approached him about it and they talked about it. So but I think Dario put the money and the effort and the time into making this one pop as this was to be the film that they both worked on together. And it was a pretty epic moment in horror history, you know, to have two maestros fucking do a movie together. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is Stivaletti's first film that he's ever directed, and I think he fucking nailed it, honestly. I don't think it's bad at all. Surprised he didn't even do more, as much more, since this movie. Like, he's only done a few, so it's a little surprising to me. But all in all, if you like gothic giallo sort of monster film with a heavy nod to seemingly dead era that we don't see much at all anymore no no you know and and at least if it's done it's not done well uh if you like gore with some pretty batshit crazy scenes i think you'll like this movie it's it's really surprised me you know it's not it's not perfect it's not great but it's good and i'd say i'd probably give this one like a seven or a seven point five from my expectations, I guess, from a sort of style of the movie, it kind of really got me into it, man. Like, I, I was really surprised by it. It made me a somewhat of an acquired taste for some of you viewers out there. But I think that if you have watched Fulci and Argento films, I think you can get into this one. Oh, yeah. But if not, it might be a little jarring for you. So it's hard for me to say. Hopefully that gives you a spectrum of uh, what you would do. Did you say what you would do, Gore was? I didn't give a score, actually, but uh, I would say, you know, I think I would give it like a 7. Maybe not a 7.5. Yeah, like it was better than average. It did more than you thought it was going to do. Yeah. But it didn't do great things. Exactly. That's pretty much where a 7 is to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, I mean, that's fine. I, I think it's about that, 7, 7.5. So yeah. I'm surprised that you liked it as much as you did, to be honest. I thought you were going to shit all over me. No, I, I think it was really the practical effects that really nailed it home for me. Well, it's interesting because, you know, Stivaletti was the, the practical effects guy. He was the set design guy. He was also the director. And like I said, all those things were fucking perfect. Right. Like the set design. It, it, it just everything was married. So perfect. I almost wanted to be better. Yeah. Just for the, I think it could have been so much better. I think they did really good for the budget that they had, though. Yeah, right. Honestly. If they had a little bit more money behind it, it, it probably could have been one of the best cult classic films out there. I, I don't know about that, but I mean, for a 90s movie, this is pretty damn good. Yeah. For that style to be able to go back, not just in a period piece, but to give it that, that Italian 80s style of camera work and mm-hmm. stuff, to give those like real static, nice shots and uh gore it just it felt good and i'm surprised by it and i'm 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 really kind of sad that i didn't watch it sooner but i guess it's nice to have the blu-ray copy so thanks plimp (laughs) (laughs) thanks plimpkey but um 
So now we're going to get into some of our spoiler thoughts on this. It's going to have some of the trivia. Um, as some of you may or may not know, Fulci died before being able to do this movie. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Stivaletti and some of the thoughts on everybody that worked on this film about that as well. So if you want to stick around for the trivia, I'll try not to spoil too much in that. Uh, and then we'll get into the scenes and stuff after that. So, um So some of the trivia on this, Sergio Stivaletti, of course, you know, I told you he did it a lot on this film, but he had said that he had always wanted to direct, but he kept it super discreet, super quiet. He only vaguely mentioned it to um, to like uh, Argento in passing. Yeah, he never really brought it out. But when Lucio Fulci passed away, they were um, kind of not knowing what to do. So they handed him the keys, you know, and they were like, okay. You know, they finally settled on it. He was like, look, I already know all of the scenes for the most part. Um, He's like, I know what I have to do for this, the the practical effects. So I'm already in this from the get for a long time. So I might be able to take it over. And so he was like nervous. (laughs) He was a little scared. Um, But uh, on set, a lot of the actors and actresses and people who worked on the set said he was very timid and very shy but it's his first film come on give the guy a break he just got handed the keys to fucking you know two maestros fucking movie for his first time of yeah. course you're gonna be a little fucking nervous you're gonna be pretty intimidated yeah for well sure. yeah and and so like you know unlike fucking Fulci who would have been like what the fuck you know like <laughs> I don't know how Argento was really but I, I believe they were kind of polar opposites in in some regards um but um, Dario Argento and uh, Fulci never officially met until a film festival that Suave and Fulci also attended in Rome called Fanta Festival in 1994. So that was like their first time ever meeting after all these years of being big Italian directors. Isn't that weird? It's pretty weird. They uh, I mentioned earlier that they sort of had a, like a rivalry in the Italian film industry because Argento at the time was considered to be the master of fucking horror, pretty much like and Fulci was kind of the guy that was kind of like fighting at the scraps, you know, because he never got the the money in some regards, but he still made those scraps shine. So Argento kind of felt like he stole some of his giallo style from him a little bit, and he said that annoyed him greatly. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is really funny. But he, he did set that aside at the festival and said he would like to produce a picture of his. Which I thought was really cool of him. And apparently he said it was like in a wheelchair. And they were like kind of going around. And he was like, oh my God, that's fucking Fulci. What the hell? Um, but they apparently originally wanted to work on... Their first idea was to work on a mummy picture. So they were going to do like a mummy movie. Hmm. And they decided against it because they thought it would be too dated. And they wanted to kind of go for something a little bit more, a little bit more modern, um, even though it's set in 1900s Paris, France, but <laughs> it's more modern than, I guess, mummies. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but Argento even said that he went to the, the funeral uh, and nobody was there. Not like no people, not as many people as he thought would be there. Uh, he gave a speech about his life and like his troubles and like what he had to deal with and stuff. And uh, apparently as they were bringing his body out of the church, they had double booked the church. Oh, no. And there was a wedding coming in at the same time. <laughs> oh, man. It's terrible, right? And like they 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 apparently tried to argue with the, the priest or whatever. And he was like, there's nothing I can do. So nothing I can do. And they were like, this is Fulci, man. Like, like, what the fuck? You know, so uh, one of the you better straighten this shit out. There's going to be fucking three funerals today. Right. right? I know. Like, (laughs) but the the, the really endearing thing in that behind the scenes thing was Argento said that he really loved Fulci, though. Oh, yeah. He admired him. Hmm. Uh, So a lot of people out there who are like picking sides or something like that. You could set that shit aside. Why? 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 Anyway, if there is anybody. (laughs) Um, But apparently... Uh, you know, Troll 2. Right. Claudio Fragasso was supposed to direct this film. Supposedly, Argento told him that Fulci, some of his last words were, if I didn't do it, I want him to direct it in his place. Fragasso was like, what? That didn't sound like him at all. Like, <laughs> he would have never said that shit about the me. The jackass said that? Yeah. <laughs> He was like, he would have never said that, but Fergasso said it was far too complex of a film for him to shoot, and he didn't want to do it. He didn't like it. So 
He also had a a really big paying gig. He had some of the top actresses and actors in at Italy at the time, so he kind of jumped on that. But he said that Argento was like being kind of mad about it. He was like, "How dare you? Like, why would you turn away Fulci's last wish? Like, how dare you?" Yeah. And Claudia Fragasso's wife was like, "If it's so good, why don't you direct it?" <laughs> but I guess. At the time, there was like a big argument about this because Fulci and Argento were talking and they got into an argument about something uh, early on. I think it was like, I don't don't remember what it was, but they got into an argument because Argento mentioned that he might want to direct it and Fulci did not like that or something. So I think that might be why he didn't want to direct it as a like respect. Yeah, out of respect for sure. So... But that's when they asked Stivaletti to do it, which, you know, he said he was a bit nervous about taking on the Fulci film. Uh, but he'd already read the script and added on a few elements of visuals and everything else pretty much stayed the same. So it's pretty much Fulci's writing with Argento and uh, Danielle. So interesting, kind of sad, fucked up thing about how Fulci died uh, in the documentary. He was Argento was talking about him and he was like. It's really sad how he passed away. Apparently, I guess Fulci was going home that night uh, after, you know, work. They were working on the script. You know what I mean? The screenplay, I should say. They were working on it. And he was like, he had to go home because he was a diabetic and he had to take his medication. He was such a bad diabetic that if he didn't take his medication, he would die. So he, he always had to go home. And apparently he went home that night. His daughter lived with him at the time, and she would uh, make sure that he would take his medicine all the time. And she, that night, decided that she wanted to go on a date or something with somebody. She was, like, very insistent on him making sure he took his medication. But Fulci's like, um, oh, come on, you know, uh, how would I ever forget? And Argento was like, don't forget, Fulci was actually a doctor. Like, he had a doctorate. Oh, I didn't know that. So I, I don't I don't think I've ever knew that either. But he was like, yeah, he was a doctor and he meant it very seriously. I don't, it didn't sound like he was being sarcastic. But he said, you know, I, you think I would forget to take my medicine? Like, how stupid do you think I am kind of thing? And she was like, are you sure? You know, and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, I guess apparently, you know, he was a huge fan of film. He even at the time was living in a smaller neighborhood, um, you know, way away from Rome at the time when they before they started writing. And then when they started writing, he got paid, you know, to do this movie. So he moved to Rome right next to a movie theater so that he could watch movies every time. Hmm. And he was at home at this particular night when his daughter went out to a, uh, like a date or whatever. And he forgot to take his medication. Mm. So hours later... He started to realize it, and in a desperate move, he reached out to grab a chocolate bar because, you know, it helps diabetics to, like, level out out just enough to try to get help. Yeah. So, apparently, when he passed away, tragically, he was reaching for the phone and couldn't even swallow the chocolate and died right there. Oh, wow. He was literally on the floor reaching out for the phone. So, pretty sad. Yeah. So, oof tragic man guy i never knew that i never heard that story before that's the first time i'm hearing it yeah i've never i've and i've done a lot of like digging on him a lot but i i guess i you know maybe that's not something you want to look for so <laughs> yeah. you know you don't want to hear about that story but you know life's a bitch right so did you have any particular scenes that you thought were really good or i definitely like the uh the sets as far as the wax museum goes and the setups that he did yeah i like, think they were all very Good look. They had to be real wax oh, statues. No, I think they weren't wax. There was. He was talking about something interesting in the documentary. Stivaletti said that mm, Lucio Fulci wanted he, the way he wrote it originally before they all touched it uh, was that everybody would be covered in wax, like bodies, like would just be covered in wax. But you know, Stivaletti's a practical effects guy, so yeah, he did it in fake skin and well i i definitely like all the scenes that were in the wax museum they all look really good and very creepy and, and as far as the set design for the wax museum the door was fucking amazing that yeah. led into the museum i always liked that medusa head thing yeah there was a, a doctor or a man of power or something that was at a brothel or something like that and then this other rich guys like i'll pay you 20 lira you know, 
in 1890, so I don't know what the fuck that is. That's a lot of money back then. Apparently. Yeah, probably like a like a couple hundred bucks, like three hundred, maybe like five hundred dollars or something like that. Uh, but the girl next to him, who's like a uh, a lady of the night, is she's like that's worth so many nights with me. <laughs> she, wasn't he talking about having babies with this girl later like, on? Yeah. I think yeah, but right off the bat, I was like instantly drawn into the wax sculptures and that when he's like skulking around in the museum at night for this bet and that medusa head drops and the eyes glow i thought it was a really cool scene i was like kind of makes you wonder like how deep does this go do they come to life well, that's what i was thinking i was like is this a real medusa is there some kind of like i know, almost kind of wish it went that way me too yeah i mean it's really schlocky and all over the place but it kind of would have been fun because you know i like the, the supernatural well it's like that other movie the um the Wax Museum, or what is it called? Waxworks, sorry. Okay. Waxworks, yeah, where they come to life. I don't know. It's cool. Yeah, I, I kind of thought the same thing you did, like, I because they started moving and stuff, and I was like, well, what's Yeah, why on? are they moving? There's yeah. no way Wax Museum, you know. But then I realized they got all these pulleys and mechanisms and shit, so. A lot of kid killing in this movie, too, by the way. Did you notice that? Yeah. <laughs> like, two kids in the beginning. They're killed with a needle, which, by the way, that needle rig he uses on people is the one I was talking about. It's fucking badass. Mm -hmm. Looks like way overdone, and it's so cool. For some reason, it reminded me of like Skinny Puppy, like a Skinny Puppy video. Really? Yeah. It did seem like something that I think Ogre or Navik Ogre would have been very into. Well, he's probably into that whole gothic era. Yeah. That's probably why. Also, why the fuck did they show a kind of older kids breasts in this movie yeah that I, was like weird for me and yeah. i was like i know it's an italian film and it was done for in an aesthetic way but too much yeah i felt bad watching that scene it's like i need to go turn myself <laughs> into the authority yeah that felt a little awkward for me and I, but i mean again different cultures you know maybe it's not a big deal to them i don't know but for me, it was awkward. <laughs> Made me feel dirty. Yeah, I was like, oof. Oh, no, 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 not for me. But they did it because they needed to show that she was bleeding still because after he needled her in the neck, it just kind of like puts her body in the stasis where it's like ready for the wax fix. Mm. Oh, and I forgot to mention the opening credits are pretty cool, too, with the guy injecting some sort of green drug into a dog cut open. And that is clearly yeah. still alive. And I thought that, that was like, cool. Medical book he was flipping right. through. Right. It Dude. all looked really meticulously well done. Yeah, it was all good. Yeah, it almost kind of reminded me of like fucking Reanimator almost at that point in time. Yeah. Like I, I, I mean, didn't even make that connection to you just Really? Said it. Yeah. I mean, like that's pretty obvious. That's like, like one of my favorite films too. Green solution and the fucking, blue solution. Yeah. And, uh, anyway. Um but they they at the very beginning there is like, you know, you see this scene where the investigator comes in and then like sees this guy's heart ripped out of his chest his hand removed someone's dead in the bathroom like all this fucking murder and chaos and they find a little girl under the fucking sink well now they go back to that while the murder actually happened so it's like on at that moment and holy fucking shit was that badass yeah dude that was a really cool fucking sequence dude he fucking like grabs his fucking arm and just twists his wrist until it fucking snaps and starts spraying blood. Dude, the best part is when he reaches into his fucking chest, dude, to grab yeah. his heart and it comes out the fucking the mattress at the yeah, bottom. He punches into his chest, it goes out his back, through the fucking mattress, and you see the heart in his fucking weird claw hand. And then he pulls it out and pulls it up and it's still beating. And it was like the guy, that was cool. And he must have did it to the girl that he was with, too, because he takes these hearts and he puts them on a fucking shish kebab. Oh, you forgot he sliced his throat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He sliced his throat, too, which looked awesome. That He slices his throat first, I think, and then... Rips his hand off. Rips No, no, no. He rips his hand off first, slices his throat, punches and, a hole uh, through his there chest. You go. I was like, whoa, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> like, that shit was awesome. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought, I thought, like, thought that was really cool. I like the effigy thing where they were showing how that girl, the prostitute from the brothel or whatever... Uh, who gets transformed into a fucking effigy, a, a wax figure? Right, with the that was the the one where there it was a uh, Jack 
the Ripper. I'm talking about when she's in that rig, the wax in the basement where he train he drains her body. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah, like, yeah. what are you talking about? I'm like, <laughs> he drains her body and then fills it with wax. And she becomes back to normal, but she's wax. Yeah. And then he's like using the machine to kind of like position her where he wants her. Right. Yeah. That was, that was but, which awesome. is really weird, too, because like it's all like aesthetically really great and everything. But I've noticed that all the burned wax figurines and stuff later on. How the fuck did he get the metal wiring and stuff? Or were those veins? I think they were veins. So he just, is that what that was? Yeah. Because they look like metal cyborg-y kind of things. Because if you notice, like you were saying at the beginning when he was looking through the book, like they were, he was he was studying a lot of the vein work within the body as well. Okay, maybe that's what it was. Okay, well, that makes sense. I mean, I didn't think about it until just now, but I was like, when they're fit melting and stuff, like their veins become metallic? Yeah, I think it was just maybe because, you know, blood is blue before it hits air, but it still doesn't make sense because... Well, no, no, the, when, they, when they drop one of the fucking uh, statues, it bleeds blue but that's the stuff he puts in it yeah maybe it was just a, the solution that is <laughs> replacing the blood right yeah yeah because it oxidizes when it hits the air mm -hmm. but that is something he put in it because he drains them pulls out all the blood and everything and then puts all this stuff in it like this weird blue solution and that they're still alive he can maintain keeping them alive even in this state isn't that weird? Yeah. I don't know. It's pretty, I don't know. This is, it's pretty complicated, but I don't know if I, I mean, it doesn't really make any logical sense. Yeah, it doesn't. I really love the scene where the detective is killed by himself. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I was going to say a lot of these shots, like, I don't want, I don't want to take it away from your scene. So you go ahead, but no, I'm no, gonna, no, I just want to say, especially in that scene, one of the shots that I really adored was the record player oh where the blood was on it yeah and how it, it was just going through the blood and just stopped right it was just i liked i just liked that the detective is sitting there and then he hears somebody come in kind of but doesn't realize it and he's like wait there's somebody behind me and then he looks and then he's like goes to grab the gun on the bed even shoots the guy or himself i mean rather you know because he like put on this wax mask of the detective mm -hmm. and goes to get him i just thought it was really cool it was like a nice touch very cool thing to add into there uh and now i'm starting to realize that dark man trilogy uh, and the like connection there because it's very similar yeah uh to that that kind of thing but i think his reaction would have been any of ours were like wait a minute what the fuck that's me right and it would have tripped me out too but like a, like a doppelganger was coming to kill me and take over my life <laughs> or something. I wouldn't have thought it was a wax mask guy, you know, like what the fuck? Um, funny scene after that is uh, Sonia and the photographer boyfriend are talking about the detective's death because she's worried that Boris, a.k.a. the wax mask guy, is on to her because they were collaborating to try to take Boris down because she works for him. And he tells her to lay low and to never step foot in the wax museum again. She was like, I'm so worried. I don't know what to do. And he's like, well, just never step foot in the wax museum again. Literally the next scene, she's skulking around in the goddamn wax museum. <laughs> they never learn, Patrick. They never learn. <laughs> I just, I laughed so hard at that part, dude. I was like cracking it's up. It's like the, we are not stopping for fucking ice cream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dude, like, I was like, what the fuck are you doing? But I guess, you know, story wouldn't be interesting if she didn't fuck herself up on that, yeah. you know. But um, did you like the scene where they melt Boris's face off? Oh. Because, like, her boyfriend and him get into a scuffle in the basement because yeah. he tries to save her because she's all in that weird position rig getting ready to get injected and sucked out puts him in front of that fucking machine that like sucks all the blood out and then pumps it back in it's like some they're like scuffling around it and then he like burns the boyfriend's face on it and then the boyfriend ducks and then it i guess they pull something and steam shoots out and just fucking you see like bits of his skin just flipping off mm -hmm. like and it looked really cool like how they did it i don't know how they did it so perfectly but it looked really cool it have been know. a happy accident do you know what i'm talking about you remember that scene oh yeah okay I also was kind of fond of the Terminator Boris as well, so... <laughs> Dude, I'm so <laughs> glad you fucking said that. Well, everybody does, apparently, because I watched the fucking behind the scenes. Everybody called... He, even Stivaletti himself calls it Terminator. Dude, because, like, when I saw that scene where, like, he's completely with no flesh. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Yeah, dun, 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 dun. 
Yeah, dude. I was like, I mean, I'm being, I'm kind of joking. I didn't really like it that much, but it, it, it's that's where it gets a little too bad shit for me because it's like, well, where, how the fuck is he surviving all of that? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I don't know what kind of blood is supporting the movement of his body. There's or, like literally nothing in him but metal. Like, how the fuck is he moving around? There's like a- we said earlier, if there was some kind of supernatural attachment to this film, it, it may have made a little bit more sense. It's, but, uh, yeah, right. Well, it, it, well, it's kind of like reanimator version of it, but you know, still, it's just kind of too silly. Yeah, it kind of it like low brows the fucking movie too much Mm -hmm. it feels like it takes away from it a little bit but i totally get it i just feel like there should have been some meat tucked in there somehow something like a heart beating you know there was i yeah but i mean like it was literally the only thing inside of him well maybe he like created some veins that pumps a little blue stuff throughout i don't know (laughs) he's got the blue blood I mean, whatever. It didn't take away from my enjoyment, so to speak. So right. it was just like, okay, this is where we're going now. <laughs> okay, all right. I see what you are doing, Stivaletti. So, uh, what did you think about the twist? Um, what twist? What? Do you, which one are you talking about? The the oh, how he was the his assistant, Alex. Yeah, was like the bad guy. He was like, well, I think. They're both cyborgs sent from the future, by the way. <laughs> yeah, they're all fucking, yeah, Terminators T-1000, whatever the fuck, T-4000s. <laughs> now, if this is 1900s, who knows, you know? Why would they go that far? John Connor wasn't even in this movie, so it's weird. They're going for, is it great, great, great? Yeah. <laughs> what if we kill his great, great, great <laughs> grandfather? Chun, 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 chun. <laughs> <laughs> the wax mask. <laughs> <laughs> and i actually just watched the terminator i watched uh, genesis again which by the way one of my favorite terminator movies really there's something wrong with you but anyway um i i thought it was kind of an interesting touch though that they added alex because there's a part of you that's like oh wait no 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 don't do that like i kind of like no he can't get away like they were i guess they wanted to like continue it on but then you could just watch dark man and then like get into it that <laughs> kind of similar i don't know it's uh, i don't know it's just i like that actor who played alex actually i thought i thought he was pretty creepy for the role dude and i thought he was really good but you can tell that like he had turned that guy into a statue for himself to make him work for boris and then he became the master because remember there's that scene earlier where he talks about how he gets he got beat by his master before him and that Boris would never hurt him. And that's why he admired him so much. He was like, I just want, because he ca- he talks to Sonia. And he was like, I just want you to know that I am second in command. And I don't, you are not taking over. Remember? Yeah. And then he somewhere, ever, I don't remember who he was talking to. But after he, he beats the shit out of, Boris beats the shit out of Alex. That's when he turns. And he's like, just takes over his stuff, I guess. Hmm. I don't know. I'm sure somebody could has probably written a script for a sequel somewhere, but I don't think it did well enough to it's warrant tucked it. It's deep, deep in a drawer somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it needed one, to be honest. I think this movie should have just been a one thing, one time and done yeah. thing. But it was interesting to have that little twist at the end. I hated the fire in the movie. Yeah, it's super just, fake. Dude, Jesus Christ, 90s obliteration of fucking visual effects. Yeah. Like, just terrible. They just discovered CGI, and they're like... I guess, dude. Like, unfortunately, I'm not saying that they're terrible people or anything, but it just looked bad. Do you know how hard it is to make fire, dude? Yeah, really well, hard. <laughs> there's other ways to do it that you can kind of make it. But yeah, they could have built a model that made it look like it. Yeah. Anything. I would have appreciated that more than seeing fake flames burning in the windows and like that looked completely like low res quality fucking flames. Yeah. Almost I don't know animated. It. Yeah, yeah, it was oh woof. Woo <laughs> That really took it down a notch for me right there. Yeah. But, you know, all in all Still enjoyed it, though. It was a good watch. I thought so, too. I'm kind of glad I got it now, and I definitely will watch it again. It's not going to be something I watch all the time. and uh, you know, It's like uh, when you have a craving for something you don't eat all the time, you're just like, oh, I'm really in the mood for that. Yeah, you'll just be like, oh, yeah, I remember. Oh, yeah, you know, I should watch that again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, I mean, have you guys seen it before? Have you ever watched it before? Did you guys pick up the Severin copy? Um, This uh, just came out this week, this past week, I guess, for you guys right now. But, um, yeah, 
I don't know. I thought it was a really good copy. Uh, I'll put a link down for that if you guys want to pick it up, by the way, uh, from Severin in the notes here so that you can uh, do it on the website here at longlivethevoid.com. So love to hear your thoughts about it. Did you like it as much? Maybe I'm just so late to the game that it's actually okay for me and you need to rewatch it again. Maybe you're right. It sucks and I'm just terrible at doing this shit, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> I fucking enjoyed it. Patrick liked it. So it's two against all thousand of you or whatever. <laughs> You lose. You lose. <laughs> uh, but next week, I don't know if Patrick's going to be here or not. I probably won't be. I'm he will sorry, not be. Guys. Uh, so I'm probably going to have on uh, somebody. Um, we might have Rebecca Reinhardt on. We'll see. I got to see if she's still available for next week. Um, but um, thinking possibly going down the Return of the Living Dead one through three. You're going to do three? I thought you did three. Yeah, but we, we could do it all three together. I mean, I love three. So I won't be here, but you guys have to know. Yeah. Three is my absolute. It's return. Halloween, guys. You got to do some of the greats. You know what I mean? You got to watch Evil Dead, Evil Dead Two. You got to watch fucking Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. You got to watch all the fucking classics and uh, try to get it in there. I'll, I'll still be mixing it in with some new movies for sure. But for the podcast, I feel like it's stuff I need to watch. Some stuff that I like to watch a lot. You got to okay. Let me just say this right now. And if you do reanimator, give me a heads up and I will see what I can do to come back. <laughs> oh, now you can fucking figure out how to get over here. Okay, I see how it is. The, yeah, you we know what I'm saying. We don't even know if Patrick's coming back, by the way, guys. He's, he's got a kid, so his life is over at this point. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> his, uh, his hobbies are dead. Uh, everything is gone. He's going to be gone for... No, I'm kidding. I, you're always welcome back. I never, ever close the door on you, ever. Not once. Uh, you never have. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, give me a heads up. Yeah. We'll yeah. S- we'll see. You let me know. I don't know what your situation is going to be like. If, you, if you're doing you reanimator, inf- you let me know. You're going to be like sitting in the dark, like fucking Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now, talking some crazy <laughs> shit. Like fucking like <laughs> after having a kid or something. <laughs> I don't know, man. You got to let me know how that is, dude. I'm I'm down, though. You're always welcome here, dude. It sucks. I don't want you to go, man. I don't want to go either. <laughs> don't why, are you have, why are you going to have kids? <laughs> right. Is it too late to... Oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, no. I'm sorry. Oh, no. I, you know I'm kidding, right? You yeah. know I'm fucking kidding, dude. Of course. Dude. <laughs> no, I'm going to fucking shame you. I'm going to fucking shame you on Facebook. <laughs> All right, do a shot with me. This is going to be the last shot we do for a while. Are we? It's going to be comforting because <laughs> we got some southern Dude, comfort. I'm sorry, dude. I had to go there. I just, I'm so fucking, <laughs> so stupid, dude. I'm sorry. All right. I love you. I love Kelly. I'm I'm happy for you All guys. Right, I want to dedicate this shot to Sid Haig. To Sid Haig? All right. All right. Cheers. Rest in peace, brother. I don't know if I want to do SoCo. Next time. Woo! Can we cheers with like something better? We will. Uh, well, all right, guys. So thank you so much for coming by this week. We'll be back with a brand new episode next week. I hope you tune in. We're going to need all the support and love that you can get up here because this podcast is going to shit. I hate my life. Fuck all of you. Good night. <laughs> Long live the. <laughs> All right, guys. So thank you so much for coming by. We really greatly appreciate you. If you listen to the end, our secret password of the day is Tutti fucking fruity. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sh- share it with your friends. If you know somebody that would enjoy this podcast or as much as you do, please share it with them. We'll be back with a brand new episode next week with somebody. I don't know who yet, but we'll figure it out. I love you guys. And as always, long live the void. Two minutes.